Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Robin Bramley from Ixus, and this afternoon I'm going to be talking about um, solar at Virgin Money Giving. And obviously I've got a bit of a tough slot with, um, against Uve, so it, maybe it's not as many participants as we might have hoped for, um, but I'm going to get underway anyway. So, in essence, the topic is around how solar helps charities raise money, um, and I'm going to start by giving you a little bit about my background, talk about some of the challenges in um, launching Virgin Money Giving, and then we're going to talk around um, the search implementation within an open source service-oriented architecture, and some of the, the technical constraints and technical goals that we set, um, and then how we met those. And lastly, um, you know, we're going to talk about the lessons learned and, and now what alternative solutions are available. Um, so I've worked in consultancies for all my, all my career. I've um, only joined three companies, but I've worked for six due to acquisitions. Um, and I first got introduced to Lucene when I was working at a company called Rubus with um, Mark Harwood, who's one of the Lucene committers. Um, and I'm kind of well qualified to give this talk because I was the lead architect on the Virgin Money Giving project. And it was a large program that spanned um, three distributed development teams in two continents um, and in terms of the outsourced portion of the work it was 27 man years of effort but we're just going to focus on on the search side today uh, and then around the edges I also write some stuff so I'm a Groovy Mag author and I recently had an article on using Lucene and Grails published um, I'm also a, a, I also blog so and DZone have given me a most valuable blogger award and I find some time somehow to do open source contributions as well. So probably um, the biggest one was the open ID support in ASEGI, um, the Spring Security Framework, and that came out of the sandbox for Spring Security 2. Um, and, and then um, about a year ago, I introduced CodeNARC support for the violations plugin in um, Hudson and Jenkins Continuous Integration Server. So moving on to the topic, I'll give a, a sort of a brief introduction to um, some Virgin and how sort of Virgin Money Giving came about. So Virgin is um, a very recognisable brand and um, Sir Richard Branson, who you see there, and that's the cover of one of his books, um, is an iconic entrepreneur and he's also you know, well known as a billionaire who's quite philanthropic. Um, so Virgin itself was founded in 1970, originally to sell mail order records, so hence the, the from vinyl in the, in the slide title. And they shortly afterwards launched um, a, a sort of record store on Oxford Street in London. Within two years, they then had a record label, um, and it's kind of grown from there. And essentially, the Virgin Group is a venture capital organization, and there have been over 300 companies um, launched with the Virgin brand, with everything from Coke, vodka, trains, planes, um, and now they've recently opened their um, spaceport in New Mexico, so Virgin Galactic is the world's first space line. Um, and Virgin Money provides financial services um, within the UK, so they offer things like a mortgage, pensions, credit cards. Um, so Virgin Money Giving came about on the back of the London Marathon. So um, the London Marathon is, um, was established 30 years ago, and it's one of the, sort of the big five major marathons in the world. It also holds the record for um, the world's largest annual fundraising event. And last year, the entrants managed to raise over 50 million pounds for charity between them. And Virgin signed a five-year sponsorship deal for um, sponsoring the London Marathon, and their stated aim was to raise over 250 million pounds um, for charity through the five years of their sponsorship. Um, so time for a bit of audience participation. Has anyone run a marathon? No? And which marathon did you run? Last year, marathon. And how much did you raise? Uh, Good job. So did you use Virgin Money Giving as the official, the official platform? <laughs> wow. So. Um, Virgin Money Giving was a brand new not-for-profit business um, and it was launched in direct competition with uh, an established profit-making firm who's just been named. And um, the Virgin have this principle of everyone's better off uh, and this comes from um, 
from the top down. So obviously being a billionaire, Rich Branson's set up his foundation, Virgin Unite, to do charitable work. But you know, they, they believe that you know, everyone should be better off. And the fact that um, the direct competitor um, didn't, um, or made a £6 million profit in the year before um, the launch of Virgin Money Giving, you know, they kind of felt that you know, th th that balance wasn't quite right. That was money that should be going to charity and going to good causes. Um, so along the lines of everyone's better off with Virgin Money Giving, you know, with fundraisers and donors, it's the fact that more money is going to the causes that they care about. So, you know, for all the people who've had some lost relatives to cancer, you know, they, some of these people will actually do something about it and go and raise money. Um, and for charities, they're paying the sort of lowest fees that um, Virgin Money Giving can offer because they're not for profit. And obviously, Virgin Money, on the flip side, it's brand awareness. So, you know, more people know about them and may investigate their services. Um, so. The kind of the business challenge was that they needed to launch for the start of the marathon campaign um, so that obviously people could start fundraising in time for um, the first Virgin Marathon. And in some ways it, it was kind of up against the sort of iron project triangle. You know, there were f features that had to be there because of the competition. There was the timescales for the marathon campaign and because they're not for profit, obviously it didn't have a huge budget. So. It's, um, and that's where, in some ways where kind of open source comes in as well. So search is pivotal for the site. Um, and you know, it, it's up there on the front page, as we'll see in a minute. And the fundraisers need to find charities or events. The donors need to find charities. And sponsors need to find fundraisers, unless they're coming in on a, sort of a direct URL. Um, so the front page search. You've got some essentially a simple search, and this is this powered by Lucene. Um, and if you search for Headway, um, which is a charity that I've been involved with, then you know the one of the first branches that props up is um, uh, one that I was personally involved with. So on the on the kind of the technical side, what were the constraints? Um, you know, obviously they were aiming for quite a broad market of um, and, and a high number of users in, in terms of user accounts and it was a, a layered service oriented architecture so we knew we wanted to offload that full text search burden from the database um, it needed to fit into a service oriented architecture and obviously you know the the open source um, route was preferred for cost effectiveness um, and in fact other than a couple of existing assets the entire sort of infrastructure that was built for Virgin Money Giving is open source. So we also set some goals. So, okay, we know it needs to fit into service oriented architecture. So something that a search service is going to have an advantage over building something ourselves on top of Lucene. But the other aims we set were um, not polluting the business logic with search APIs. And, and then we wanted to be able to serve the results directly from um, the, the query results. We, we wanted to be able to sort of scale out the, the query load to replicas um, and because of the, the nature and sort of visibility of the Virgin brand it needed to be um, sort of split across multiple data centres so we had to ensure that the indices were fresh across all of those. So we're going to um, dip into sort of each one of these goals. So th the first goal was not polluting the, the business logic. So Indexing at the end of the day is a technical concern that's come about because we had a technical goal. It's nothing to do with the business logic. You know, a business, the business code needs to say, well, someone's created a charity. You know, it shouldn't then go, well, actually, go and index this or, and go and add it to um, the, uh, the general ledger finance system, et cetera, et cetera. So, the approach here was um, a kind of an event-driven model. So for indexing, we had event-driven indexing. And this was realized using Spring application events, um, the Java messaging service, and then having message-driven pages on the other end. And lastly, we used SolarJ client to get that into um, Solar. Uh, we can illustrate that in a pictorial form. So at the top, we've got the event source. So this is where the business logic is emitting an event, the fact that a business event has occurred. 
Um, so it could be um, a, a fundraiser is registered. This is then um, received by an application event listener. So this pattern is sort of common in operating systems, um, but for sort of general developers, there's not necessarily a huge amount of visibility of this style. Uh, the, um, the events are then sort of transformed into something that's more meaningful. That's put on a, uh, a message queue, and it goes to a message-driven POJO, and that results in um, a SolarJ doing a, an ad of the document. Yesterday there was a tweet about the fact there were, weren't enough code samples in, in the slides, so we'll have a quick bit of pseudo-code. Obviously I can't um, show the real code. So event publishing in Spring, the, the first thing you need to do is implement the application event publisher aware interface. So when the Spring container starts up, it, it, it will find, um, find in classes that implement this interface, um, and it will inject an application event publisher into them. So we've, we declare an application event publisher and have a setter for it. Um, and then in a, a business method, um, we can, down the bottom in red, we can create um, a custom event, populate that with data, and then to emit it, we just tell the application event publisher to publish that event. To then sort of register your custom listener, again, you implement the application listener interface. Um, and the Spring Framework handles the, the registration of these. Um, there's one kind of method on, on that interface, which is on application event. So when you get the event, how, you know, how are you going to handle it? One of the, the kind of gotchas with Spring application events are they're handled synchronously. So it will go, it will send every single event to all the listeners. So it's just something you need to be aware of. Um, and because of that, you know, we need to pick out, make sure we're only handling the event that we're actually interested in. So it may be something's created or something's deleted. So you can then handle that accordingly. Um, so the next, the next goal was um, being able to present the results directly. And, and this was to prevent additional database reads. And because of the layered service-oriented architecture, we'll, we'll see in a minute why that's such a, sort of a bad thing in this case. So this was handled through um, sort of careful schema design, effectively. In a very simplified view of the world, we had um, a, set of, a set of tiers. Um, at the top, you've got the presentation web applications, um, and they would typically talk to an orchestration service um, and then down to a persistent service. So if they're creating data, it would traverse down the tiers. There are also a set of utility and integration services, um, and the, um, the search service was a, effectively a utility service. So when you make a search, it sort of comes down and up, and that's fine. But if you then say, well, actually, I need to go and fetch more information about each one of these hits, then you'd have ended up with a sort of a traversal down. Um, and Obviously, a service-oriented architecture, when it's loosely coupled um, with kind of the sort of right granularity of service, there's actually a lot of overhead in transforming from the sort of canonical, this is the message we're sending, into an internal representation as you bounce between the tiers. Um, so the ability to serve them straight um, from the index was key. The schema, um, the schema design was basically kept it simple. You know the all the document types um, for the, sort of the different business objects were all in, in the same collection. There were only um, four field types. Um, they're listed there. And we had sort of simple analysis on the text. So there were, it, the idea was do it in an agile, iterative fashion, you know, see what doesn't work. So to start off with, all we did was white space tokenize it, lowercase it, and remove duplicates. Um, we, didn't even, we didn't even set the stemming on them because a lot of the time you'd be searching for someone's name or a charity name. So stemming didn't really make sense in that case. Um, all the fields were actually stored um, because there are only 14 of them, um, but not all of them were indexed because they weren't used in queries. Uh, and, and that way um, we could just serve results straight through. Um, in terms of the size of the index, storing fields makes a difference but you know, it was a trade-off that um, we decided to go with storing them. So the, th the third technical goal was um, 
read-only replicas for scale out. So um, we wanted to separate the read and write load, uh, and this was done um, at the time using snap pull replication. So snap pull replication, um, I mean the arrows show the flow of data on the diagram. In fact, what happens is on the master there's a process that either on a commit or an optimize, um, it can take a snapshot um, of the index files. And at that point it does it using hard links on um, Unix. So it will only really need to look at the ones that have changed. There's then a, a snap puller and, and this uses rsync. Um, so that runs on the replicas and essentially goes and pulls the, the new sort of dated version of the index. So, and because it's rsync and hard links, it's only actually pulling the bits that have changed. So it's, in, it's um, quite an efficient um, mechanism. There's then a snap installer which runs on the replica to install the new snapshot. And then periodically in the background, you can um, run snap cleaner to get rid of um, the old snapshots. So the, the new HTTP-based replication came in in 1.4, um, and when this went live, it was on 1.3. Um, so the this last technical goal I was going to talk about is the propagation across data centers. Um, obviously, with a sort of a visible brand, they didn't want they wanted to minimise any potential downtime. Um, so to keep the, the indices in the second site fresh, there was um, clustered JMS. So that way, if they switched sites from sort of A to B, um, then writes from one site could go to the other, and we didn't have to worry about um, sort of making, you know, stopping replication if we'd use replication across the sites. This was the final, uh, essentially the final topology for, for Solar. So um, a, a message indexing message coming in um, would get um, propagated across both sites using the cluster JMS. Each indexing service um, would handle that message, um, update its master, and then they would the updates would get um, propagated out to the replicas. Um, at launch, I, I think there were um, six replicas in each site. Um, so, in terms of the, the business results, um, the, the business launched to um, very aggressive timescales and they managed to raise over £10 million for charity in the first six months of operation. And that was actually all before um, the marathon, uh, the start of the actual marathon in 2010. Um, the project was awarded a medal in the British Computer Society 2010 Computing Awards um, in their community category. So on to the, uh, the lessons learned. So I think Grant said it's not all sunshine and rainbows. The, the replication approach has a number of challenges um, in terms of the currency, so it's, it's not a, a, sort of a near real-time thing. So there's a trade-off um, with how frequent you update your indices. If you update them too frequently, then um, your replicas start to work harder um, and they can't sustain the load. If you lengthen the update cycle, then obviously the data is not as fresh as it, it could be. So someone's someone that well, I've just created this. I'll go and search for it. Okay, well it's it's not there yet. Um, so that, I mean that's that's just a, a you know problem with the replication approach. And then consistency in in operational use, there were occasionally some um, inconsistencies between the replicas. So there may have been um, some nodes where the snap snap installer hadn't completed properly for some reason or you know, whatever it was. And also the, um, one of the, the sort of Virgin Money guys told me that they also had some problems with the cluster JMS um, implementation. You know, sometimes um, they might have a message that's consumed on, on, on one site but for some reason is um, stuck or held up um, on the other site. So again, it's just sort of temporal transit, you know, generally sort of um, transitory issues. So, you know, obviously this was built with Solar 1.3. You know, what are the alternative options available now that address some of those points? Things that, that could be looked at are, you know, Solar Cloud. Obviously there are people at the conference who are better, better positioned to talk on that than I am. Um, but with with the sort of Zookeeper Ensemble, you've got the cluster management centralised with a configuration. Um, but again, it's um, from my understanding, it's kind of 
its clustering model has eventual consistency. Um, but generally, that's because of the near real time nature, that's going to be sort of, um, in some ways a better solution now than, um, than where we were several years ago. Um, another alternative would be um, Solandra, which is a Cassandra backed um, solar. And I, I think it's a, just a different directory implementation. So rather than using file system directory, I think it uses Cassandra, um, and then it ha uses the distributed nature of Cassandra to propagate the updates around. Um, and then lastly, there's um, Elasticsearch, which um, has had a couple of mentions so far that, um, over the last couple of days. And this is a distributed RESTful search engine. So it was created by a guy called Shay Bannon, who um, worked on the Compass GPS framework. So Compass GPS, was an ORM integration. Um, so if you were using Hibernate and Compass GPS, then you could get your um, Hibernate domain objects into a Lucene index um, using the Hibernate events. So he worked on that, but he um, also worked on data grid technology. So he's been applying you know, some of his learning to Elasticsearch. Um, I have to confess that the, the only time I've really tried it out, it wasn't that successful, but I think that was probably due to the, the Grails um, Elasticsearch plugin rather than um, sort of any underlying problems with Elasticsearch itself. There's a, a set of references for um, various different things that have been in, mentioned in, in there. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Um, so the question was, um, which of the alternatives would I choose, Solar Cloud, um, Solandra, or um, Elasticsearch. So I guess the answer depends on the exact scenario. Um, if it was a situation that needed um, commercial support for the offering, then um, Elasticsearch is currently one person behind it. So that one would get ruled out. You've then got um, Solandra or um, Solar Cloud. And obviously, um, with Lucid Imagination working on Solar Cloud, I think I would sort of choose that route in, in that scenario. Um, so, so the question was, were there any, um, any issues in persuading the client to use Solar or open source? Um, so Virgin Money were um, very open to open source um, from the get-go. So uh, the, they had originally approached us about um, a, a different open source um, piece of software um, a few months before um, we got into discussions about Virgin Money giving. So the appetite for open source was there. Um, with regards to solar, um, that was a very straight decision. You know, they had their um, design steering group, so I had to um, present these are kind of the, the things that we need to achieve with a search service, um, and, and then present, well, this is solar, and this is what it provides. I mean, a number of things that I presented in that uh, initial um, sort of presentation on solar to them, like sharding um, for sort of scale out of data, didn't get used in the first implementation. Um, but no, it was, it was um, Solar was such a, a good fit that rather than building a lot of things on top of Lucene and wrapping it with the service, you know, it was it was there. It had a client. It had um, sort of restful interface. So that you know, was it was a, an easy sell. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for coming, and um, I'll, I'll be around um, if anyone wants to sort of ask any other questions. Thank you.